it's good to see all of you. Welcome to this talk um, uh, entitled Out of the Dust of the Earth, uh, the Traditions and Spiritual Practices of Lent. Uh, I'm Father Patrick Cheng, and I'm the theologian in residence at St. Thomas Church Fifth Avenue. And uh, it's a real privilege and honor to be here to speak with all of you, to talk a little bit about uh, uh, the traditions and spiritual practices of Lent. Um, I think time-wise, in terms of the schedule, uh, I've prepared about 40, 45 minutes of talk about Lent, and then uh, we would uh, sort of take a break after that and answer any questions that you might have. And as I mentioned before, if you do have any questions or comments or would just like to interact, feel free to put things uh, in the chat box. Um, all right, so I thought it would be good to just start off with the collect for Ash Wednesday. We're not quite there yet. Um, Ash Wednesday is a week from today. Uh, but I think the collect for Ash Wednesday is a good way to get us into the mindset and spirituality of Lent. So I'm going to put this up here and I'm going to invite you all to say this along with me and um, for you to sort of savor the words and think a little bit about them um, as, as we say this prayer. So let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, who hatest nothing that thou hast made, and dost forgive the sins of all those who are penitent. Create and make us, make in us new and contrite hearts that we worthily lamenting our sins and acknowledging our wretchedness may obtain of thee, the God of all mercy, perfect remission and forgiveness. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who liveth and reigneth with thee in the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever, amen. So what I'd like to talk to you uh, for the next 40, 45 minutes is uh, about Lent, which basically is the season that precedes Easter, the 40 days uh, before Easter Sunday, and um, is a journey to the cross, a time for reflection, for repentance, for preparation. And I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, these practices uh, for, uh, with you. Um, a number of you may not know where the word Lent comes from. Uh, the etymology for the word actually, you know, comes from Old English. Um, it's a shortened form of Lenten or Lengthen. Um, so it basically means lengthen, right? It, it's, a it's a reference to the time of year when the days lengthen or become longer, basically spring. Um, so even though we think of Lent as having all this you know, notion of repentance and preparation, uh, basically it's just about sort of the springtime when the days grow longer. Um, and uh, so that's just something to keep in mind in terms of where the word Lent comes from. As I mentioned, Lent is uh, a 40 day season. Um, basically the number 40 in the Bible has a lot of uh, meanings. Uh, in particular, uh, it's a time, it means a time of preparation, right? And so it's uh, appropriate that the 40 days uh, before Easter um, is uh, what we involves waiting and repentance and trials and testing. And there are a lot of biblical stories that involve 40 days. Um, for example, uh, you know, Noah's flood lasted for 40 days. Moses was on Mount Sinai, um, you know, for 40 days. Elijah walked through the desert to Mount Horeb 40 days, Jonah's warning to the people of Nineveh, um, and also the number 40, you know, in terms of the Israelites wandering in the desert, they wandered for not 40 days, but 40 years. Um, and then most significantly, Jesus, uh, so right before he started his public ministry, he had his 40 day fast in the desert, right? And in many ways, um, you know, that is probably the, the closest model of the 40 days of the Lenten season. So let's talk a little bit about um, calendars here. And I think, uh, you know, sort of dates are important because we talked about 40. Um, so basically Lent uh, this year starts a week from today um, with Ash Wednesday, the colic that we read, which is uh, Wednesday, February 17th. And um, Ash Wednesday, uh, you may know, is the day that follows Shrove Tuesday, uh, which basically is known as Mardi Gras, right? So, so basically Mardi Gras, which means um, Fat Tuesday, uh, is sort of the, you know, from, is also known as Carnival, 
uh, which comes from the Latin word carne, which means meat, right? So you have fat, you have meat, you have partying in the streets because that's sort of your last chance before you go into these 40 days of Lent. Um, so you have Shrove Tuesday, uh, oftentimes, you know, with parishes and, and pancake suppers and all that. Um, and then you've got sort of uh, Ash Wednesday. And then Lent ends on the day before Easter Sunday. Uh, so on Holy Saturday, uh, which this year is April 3rd. So you have that time period. And as I mentioned, um, Lent ends the day before Easter Sunday. And within this Lenten period, it also includes Palm Sunday, uh, which is the Sunday before Easter Sunday, which is the beginning of Holy Week. Um, and then as you can see also what's known as the Triduum, which is the Holy Three Days, uh, Triduum, uh, you know, Maundy Thursday, Good Friday, and Holy Saturday. So, you know, if, if you're not familiar with the liturgical calendar, don't worry about all this stuff. I'm just sort of putting Lent in the context of sort of major um, feast days um, and fast days. But the most important thing is it's the period from February 17th to um, April 3rd. And if you are sort of a skeptical person and you went to this calendar and you went ahead and counted all the days, um, you would find out that basically um, it's not 40 days, it's really 46 days. Um, and so you would probably just sort of say, hey, what's going on? Um, I thought you said that Lent is 40 days, um, but it is literally 46 days. But why it's 40 days is because um, Lent does not include um, the six Sundays in Lent. So the days that are X'd out, um, the notion is that Sundays are mini Easter's or mini resurrection days. So that Sundays are not included in Lent. Um, in fact, they are not the Sundays of Lent, but they are known as the Sundays in Lent in the sense that they're not counted as part of Lent. And so if you take out those six Sundays, including Palm Sunday, then you actually do end up with 40 days. Um, so that's how the math works. Um, so some of you might find this interesting, some of you may not, but uh, just wanted to sort of explain, um, you know, sort of the, the liturgical calendar. Um, and, and so, you know, the, the classical, the Latin name for Lent is quadragesima, uh, which uh, if you know Latin refers to 40, the number 40. Um, and here you have an etching from sort of a, a, um, an earlier prayer book, you know, that shows the tithing and the fasting and the abstinence and the self-mortification. Um, but, you know, earlier on, there was not only 40 days quadragesima, but there's a quinquagesima or sexagesima or septuagesima. So 40, but also 50 days before Lent, 60 days and 70 days. So there was actually a pre-Lent um, that was celebrated before the Vatican II reforms. Um, and so no need to worry about that. Right now we're focused on the 40 days uh, before Easter. And, you know, in terms of the history of Lent, uh, sometimes people think that Lent has always been around since the apostolic days. Um, but it's actually, you know, not entirely clear how, um, you know, this evolved. What is clear is that the first sort of official pronouncement by the church of Lent as being 40 days occurred during the first council of Nicaea. And so those of you that uh, may know recently, we had uh, recently we had a 12-week um, talk in terms of uh, the Nicene Creed. This was the council that had promulgated the first part of the Nicene Creed um, in 325. So it wasn't really until the fourth century that um, you know, it was the fifth canon of this council that actually said that Lent as a, you know, the preparatory season for Easter would be 40 days. Scholars think that basically um, the original preparatory period was not 40 days, but 40 hours. So people would actually fast for 40 hours um, before Easter. Um, and uh, this was to um, sort of track what people thought Jesus spent spending 40 hours in the tomb. And so that just gives you a sense as to, you know, the, the um, evolution. But again, it, it took a few hundred years uh, for this to uh, evolve into the 40 days as we know as Lent now. And I just want to mention how this fits into the liturgical year. 
Um, some of you may be sort of liturgical geeks and sort of know all about this. Others may not be familiar with the liturgical year. But if you think about um, the liturgical year as a clock, right? At 12 noon, you have sort of the beginning of the liturgical year, which is Advent or the four Sundays before Christmas. Um, you know, this past year was at the end of November. Uh, you've got sort of the four weeks of Advent. Then you have Christmas. You have the 12 days of Christmas, which gets you to Epiphany. And then the Sunday after Epiphany becomes ordinary time. And then, you know, because Epiphany is fixed in terms of January 6th, but Lent is 40 days before Easter, which is not fixed. Um, so ordinary or the ordinary time, the time after Epiphany uh, sort of fluctuates. And then, you know, you have Lent um, and then you have the Triduum, which I had mentioned the three days um, and, then, and then the season of Easter and then Pentecost uh, or 50 days after Easter. And then you're back into ordinary time. So as you can see, you know, you have the cycle of the liturgical year and Lent it occurs, you know, this, this period um, paralleling Advent, you know, in terms of the colors, right? Uh, I, as you can see, there are different colors here. And those of you that sort of have seen the vestments and all that in terms of church, you know that um, there are seven liturgical colors. Some there are more, some churches also have blue, for example. But basically you have purple, which is a time for penance or repentance or preparation. You've got red, which is uh, about the Holy Spirit or God's love or martyrdom. Uh, you have rose, which is only twice a year uh, for joy. Um, and you have green, sort of the ordinary time, life, um, Holy Spirit. And then white, which is sort of light and purity and joy for the main seasons of uh, Christmas and Easter. You have gold, which is interchangeable with white, and then black for sorrow or mourning. Uh, for uh, Requiem Masses or also uh, for Good Friday. And so for Lent, basically the two colors are purple and rose. Um, so purple is the main color, but rose, um, the fourth Sunday of Lent is Laetare Sunday. And it's sort of a break in the penitential season. So uh, basically one Sunday out of the uh, five Sundays of Lent uh, is uh, the mood is lightened. And so the vestments reflect that in terms of rose vestments. Um, and so, you know, as you can see, this is a, a photo from uh, Lent last year in terms of, uh, you know, you see how the cross is also sh shrouded, uh, you know, on the altar and you see the, all the uh, vestments and, and uh, sort of the altar hangings are, are all in the purple color. And as I mentioned, the fourth Sunday in Lent Laetare Sunday, meaning sort of joy or rejoicing Sunday, uh, is the uh, rose color. And you may recognize that in Advent, you, you know, the Advent wreath, how the third Sunday of Advent, you've got the purple, but then you also have rose, um, and that's Gaudete Sunday. So again, it's sort of Advent and Lent parallel sort of the purple, the repentance preparation notions. Um, Advent is more about preparing for the second Advent of Christ, so it's, you know, there's a bit of penitential um, sort of notion there, but it's much more so in Lent. And, um, and so basically all this talk about vestments and liturgy, just a reminder that, you know, the, the Anglican tradition, the Church of England, the Episcopal Church is a reformed church. So, you know, um, it, during the Reformation, a lot of these traditions were done away with. Um, and sort of there was a resurgence of Catholicism with a small c uh, during the Oxford movement, the 19th century. Um, and that's when a lot of these traditions came back liturgically. And as an Anglo-Catholic parish, uh, St. Thomas Church um, is an heir to the Oxford movement and Catholicism, sort of the ancient universal practice of the church um, going back, uh, you know, um, pre-Reformation. And so let me just talk a little bit about Ash Wednesday, which is the beginning of the Lenten season. And um, Ash Wednesday is known for, you know, the ashes that are burned from the palms from the previous Palm Sunday and the ashes that are imposed on the forehead. Um, and one of the interesting things is that I mentioned that, you know, the Episcopal Church Anglican um, tradition uh, is an heir to the um, English Reformation. 
Um, but one of the things that survived the Reformation was actually Ash Wednesday and Lent. So if you look at the first Book of Common Prayer in 1549, the 16th century you know, um, prayer book, which you know, uh, our current one is 1979, um, basically Ash Wednesday, the first day of Lent, uh, commonly called Ash Wednesday, you can see here, right, that, that basically Ash Wednesday was preserved. And I think a lot of Reformation types uh, felt like, you know, things like ashes and, and sort of these tangible sacraments, um, you know, were not only not biblical, but, but bordered on idolatry. And so in many Reformation churches, these practices were done away with. Um, they've come back since, you know, with the liturgical movement. But the Church of England has preserved um, this notion, even from the first Book of Common Prayer. And so I think, uh, you know, uh, honoring Ash Wednesday is an important part of, of this tradition. Um, and, you know, you may remember that the words that are, that the priest imposes on you in terms of putting the ashes on the forehead um, come from the Latin memento homo quia pulvis es et in pulverem reverteris, which is remember, O man or O person, that you are dust and to dust you will return, right? Dust pulvis. Um, and it, to dust you will return. Um, so this idea that you know the the dust, the ashes of Ash Wednesday remind us of our mortality, right? That that you know we are made from dust, and that we will after we die we will return to dust. Um, and so um, this comes you know from uh, the book of Genesis. If you look at Genesis um, chapter two verse seven. Uh, you, you know, the, the, one of the narratives about uh, the creation of human beings, uh, the narrative says, you know, on the right side, the NRSV, then the Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground, right, out of the dust of the earth. That's the title of our talk, that, that humanity, um, mankind was formed from the dust of the ground. And God breathed into the nostrils of Adam, the breath of life and the human being became a living being, right? Um, and so uh, those of you, some of you may know the Hebrew, but on the left side here, we have the Hebrew of Genesis um, chapter two, verse seven. And Hebrew, as you may know, goes from right to left. Um, so, and underneath here, we have the uh, transliteration of what the Hebrew sounds like in English. And um, so it's basically vai itzer, which means and he formed, the vi means the and, and he formed, Adonai Elohim, um, you know, the, the tetragrammaton in Hebrew, you don't speak this word, you say Adonai, which means Lord, that's why you've got uh, Lord God here. Um, so, Vayitzer Adonai Elohim, um, et ha'adam, so et means it's a direct object, you know, who the Lord God is forming. And interestingly, human, the human being, is the word Adam, which is where we get Adam from, right? And then this is interesting, apar, uh, dust, mean ha'adama. So mean means from, ha'adama means from the ground. And the ground, you can see this, is also Adam, right? It's Adama. So you've got all this wordplay going on here that if you don't know the Hebrew, you're not gonna know this, but basically the Lord God formed the human being, ha'adam, out of dust, from the ground, which is ha adama, and the human being is called Adam. So um, that's where sort of all these words come from, and this is where we get the notion of dust. And after the fall, um, you know, in Genesis three, um, you know, God tells Adam and Eve that that you know they will die, human beings will die, and they will return to dust. And that's sort of the notion of Ash Wednesday. And liturgically speaking. Uh, there are changes in the liturgy during the season of Lent. Uh, you know, uh, the, the word Alleluia is not spoken. And so, you know, during the Eucharistic prayer, oftentimes, uh, you know, people will continue to say Alleluia, um, especially at the beginning of Lent. Uh, the Gloria is not said. Um, the beginning opening prayers are changed somewhat. So there are differences, you know, to reflect uh, the more solemn penitential season of Lent. And, you know, the, the liturgy of Ash Wednesday, we, we started with the colic for Ash Wednesday, but 
um, the Liturgy of Ash Wednesday, which is found on pages 264 to 265 of the Book of Common Prayer, if you have that with you, um, basically the priest gives an invitation to a Holy Lent, um, saying, you know, how you can have a Holy Lent instructions. And this is a really helpful thing for you to meditate on about sort of the, the history of how Lent came about, but also practices how to have a Holy Lent. And so I'd like to just read this to you. Um, the priest says, dear people of God, the first Christians observed with great devotion the days of our Lord's passion and resurrection. Um, and it became the custom of the church to prepare for them by a season of penitence and fasting, right? So this is talking about Easter, talking about Holy Week, and you know you needed a time to prepare for that. Um, and as I said before, not just 40 hours, not just a few days, but rather 40 days. And this season of Lent provided a time in which converts to the faith were prepared for holy baptism. So first of all, you had converts, people who were not Christian that wanted to become Christian and wanted to be baptized um, at the Easter vigil uh, or on Easter Sunday. Um, Lent was a time for them to prepare. The 40 days were to prepare for this. Now, in the ancient days, it wasn't just the 40 days. Um, it, it often took three years for people to, to prepare to become a Christian. So if you think taking the pilgrim's course for a couple of months is tough, um, you know, in the ancient days, uh, converts took a long time, but the 40 days before Easter were particularly intense in terms of preparation. It was also a time when those who, because of notorious sins, had been separated from the body of the faithful, were reconciled by penitence and forgiveness and restored to the fellowship of the church. So in ancient days too, that if you were, had committed sins that separated you from the church, it wasn't just a matter of going to confession and just everything being okay. You actually were no longer allowed to participate in the liturgy of the Eucharist. And you had to repent for 40 days you know, um, and this is where the notion of the, the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, you know, sackcloth and ashes. Um, it took a long time to get back into the good graces of God as well as the community. And so Lent was not only time for converts to prepare, but also those who had been separated from the body of the faithful to, um, to then to be prepared to be uh, reincorporated or re restored to the fellowship of the church. And then finally, you had the whole congregation was put in the mind of the message of pardon and absolution set forth in the gospel of our savior and of the need which all Christians continually have to renew their repentance and faith. So not just the converts and not just those who had been separated, but everybody, the whole congregation, right? This was a time to prepare um, for um, you know, the joys of Easter. And I just wanna say something, you may have noticed in the colic for Ash Wednesday, you know, you, you, some of the language of Lent can be hard for people, especially if you've been hurt by the church before, right? To, to talk about your own wretchedness or how sinful we are. And I acknowledge that sometimes that's really hard to hear. Um, but I think the flip side is that it's hard to have good news unless you know what you are, you know, the good news is about, which is about being freed from the state of bondage or sin that we are in. Um, and sin, not so much as, oh, you're such a horrible person, you're going to be condemned forever. But really, you know, sin, I think of it as an, a fundamental notion of selfishness, right? That, that we are called to live, to love God, to love neighbor. Um, but, you know, I am this way, you are this way, we all are this way, that, you know, oftentimes we come first. And it's that notion of turning in on ourselves that is the fundamental notion of sin, um, that, that, you know, Lent is a time for us to get out of our thinking about just ourselves and to thinking more about God and other people. So, so this is sort of the invitation to a holy Lent. And then the priest says, I invite you therefore in the name of the church to the observance of a holy Lent by what? By self-examination or repentance, right? By prayer, fasting, and self-denial, and by reading and meditating on God's holy word and to make a right beginning of repentance. And as a mark of our mortal nature, let us now kneel before the Lord, our maker and redeemer. So that leads into the rest of the Ash Wednesday liturgy. But basically, if you ever want a refresher as to what Lent is about, go to these pages of the Book of Common Prayer, the Ash Wednesday liturgy, page 264 to 265. Self-examination or repentance, prayer, fasting, and self-denial, and by reading and meditating on God's holy word.
right? So basically Lent is a time for us to look back on our lives, to, to have some time of self-examination and repentance to, to sort of make things right, right? Because uh, none of us is perfect, far from it. Um, and it's important to recognize that. Also, as, as sort of the, um, uh, you know, these words said, prayer, fasting, um, and self-denial in term, terms of just, you know, uh, praying to God and also sort of giving up something uh, as, as a, a spiritual practice. And I'll talk more about these practices later. And then finally, reading and reflecting upon God's holy word, um, to look at scripture and thinking about scripture in a way that you might nom not normally do during the course of the year. Um, one thing I wanted to acknowledge is that, you know, sort of Lent in the time of COVID and the pandemic. Um, as some of you may know, uh, the Diocese in New York has, uh, the Bishop has said that uh, we are not to have ashes um, imposed this year. And so there will not be ashes um, on Ash Wednesday. Uh, different denominations may have different takes on this. Um, but I think for many people, it may be very hard, right, to, to you know, how can you talk about Ash Wednesday if there are no ashes? But I do want to sort of say that, interestingly, I think the Bible reading, uh, the gospel reading that we have on Ash Wednesday um, is actually super appropriate to this year, this COVID-19, this pandemic year. I think the gospel is actually even more appropriate than normal years. Why is this? Well, I don't know if you ever have thought about the gospel reading that's read in on Ash Wednesday, but basically the message of that gospel reading is that you should not show your prayer and other things to the outside world. It should be on the inside, not on the outside. And I always thought it was very strange that after you have this reading, what do we do? But we have ashes on our foreheads that then we sort of have on our foreheads all day long that we proclaim to all of New York City in the subway and on the streets that, you know, we've gone to church <laughs> and it's Ash Wednesday, which is kind of ironic, right? So, so I do want to sort of take a look at, uh, this is the standard reading from Matthew um, chapter 6, verses 1 through 6, 16 to 21. Jesus says, beware of practicing your piety before others in order to be seen by them, for then you have no reward from your Father in heaven. So first of all, when you give alms, right, giving, um, tithing. Do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets so that they may be praised by others. Truly, I tell you um, uh, that they have received their reward. But when you give alms, do not, left your, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. Basically, don't let your hands or anyone else know, you know, so that your alms may be done in secret and your father who sees in secret will reward you. So Jesus is saying, if you give to the church, you know, do it in secret. Don't let other people see you, right? This is, this is what Jesus is saying. And whenever you pray, so not just giving, but praying, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners so that they may be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward. But whenever you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your father who is in secret. And your father who sees in secret will reward you. So when you pray, go to your room and shut the door and do it in secret, right? Just like giving alms in secret, pray in secret. And then finally, whenever you fast, you know, um, do not look dismal like the hypocrites for they disfigure their faces so as to show others that they're fasting. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward. But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face. That is, make yourself look all clean and, and, you know, sort of energetic so that your fasting may be seen not by others, but by your father who is in secret and your father who sees in secret will reward you. So I've often thought it's funny that the gospel sort of talks about doing all these things in secret, and yet we have the mark on our foreheads. And I think the purpose is to remind us that even though we have this mark, you know, Ash Wednesday and Lent is not so much about the outside signs but it's really about the inside interior orientation, right? That repentance is not so much on the outside, but is on the inside. I love this notion of a U-turn sign, right? The Greek word for repentance is metanoia, which means to have a turn of the mind. It's a U-turn, right? Think of, think of Ash Wednesday and as Lent as a time to do a U-turn from your usual practices during the year. Um, and 
And so, you know, really Ash Wednesdays, the ashes are in on your heart, are inside of you, not so much on your forehead. So I think especially this year, during a time of COVID, during a time of pandemic, even though you may not be able to have the ashes, it doesn't make Ash Wednesday any less important or um, liturgically significant. Really what's going on is the repentance, the ashes that are on the inside, not on the outside. And I invite you to think about that this year. In some ways, Ash Wednesday is even more meaningful and I think even more true to the gospel of this year than any other year that you may experience Ash Wednesday. So let me talk a little bit about um, the, the uh, practices for our last 10 minutes or so before uh, we go to sort of Q&A. Um, so this, you know, these three things, to give, to pray, and to fast, this actually tracks the reading that we heard from Matthew, right? Those who give alms, uh, to pray, and to fast. Jesus tells us that we should do these three things in secret, right? God, the Father who sees us in secret, will reward us, will, will, will hear us, see us giving, praying, and fasting. So these are some suggestions of things that you can do um, you know, to, to, to honor the Lenten season. So one, you know, the first thing to give, uh, here are some suggestions. You may have heard of the phrase giving of your time, talent, and treasure. So when we think of giving and almsgiving, sometimes we only think about sort of giving money, right? But also we can, you know, it's not just about money. And in fact, sometimes it's actually more important that you give of your time or you give of your talent, your skills, um, your gifts. And, and the treasure too. But so for example, you know, in, in some years, you know, Lent might be a great time to sort of do something you normally haven't, such as the soup kitchen. But of course this year we don't have our soup kitchen uh, again because of the pandemic. But there might be ways that you can volunteer um, and that you can do things uh, that are meaningful for you, whether at St. Thomas or for the diocese or other parishes or just out in the social services world. You might think of some ways that you can give back, right, during this time. Or to give of your talent. You know, I have here sort of a Zoom screen. Um, you know, so much of what we've done since last March, since last April, is about church that's online. And what the wonderful coordinators of the young adults group, um, you know, all of these things, so much is online and, and we all need your gifts, um, you know, not just to take of this, but to give back and to give your talent too. So, so consider giving some of your gifts, um, not just your time, but your talents. Um, and then also your treasure, treasure is important. So for example, if you haven't pledged uh, for the annual appeal, it's not too late, um, you know, this year, this time, more than any other year, uh, we need help. And it's not so much about the amount, but it's really about the mindset, about sort of giving back to God what you've received. Um, so these are ways that you can give during the Lenten season. The second big category beyond giving is praying. And there's a lot of praying stuff that you can do. Um, and so I'll go through some of these and we can talk about it after during your Q&A. Um, but, you know, some of you, if you're not sort of attuned to praying a lot, these are two books that I found very helpful. Uh, perhaps Father Spencer may have talked about this before, but there's this wonderful book called The 15-Minute Prayer Solution by Gary Jansen. So I have a copy of this here, but you can see the book up over here. This book is chock full of sort of all these practices that you can do in just 15 minutes, all these different kinds of ways that you can pray. And Lent might be a wonderful way for you to try this out, like a buffet, if you will, uh, a spiritual buffet. Uh, do a different kind of prayer every day and see which one sticks, which one me is meaningful for you. Be because just like we all learn in different ways, we all pray in different ways. Um, and then if you are into sort of the Ignatian, St. Ignatius of Loyola, um, sort of the Jesuit way of the examine, sort of examining your life every, uh, examining the day every evening. Um, this book, A Simple Life-Changing Prayer by Jim Manny is also a great way. Uh, this helps you have a framework for thinking about your day at the end of the day, looking back on it and seeing what God is telling you, praying on your everyday life. So these are some wonderful resources. Um, you know, those of you that are sort of, uh, uh, that are into the Episcopal Anglican tradition, um, this Lent might be a great time to um, sort of uh, resume or continue or start uh, the daily office, you know, of morning prayer and evening prayer every day. 
Um, there is sort of the prayer books um, that, uh, you know, have the readings in there. So you can not just use the Book of Common Prayer, but you can use this as a way of praying every day. Um, and those, these are three apps that I have on my, um, my phone, uh, basically Electronic Common Prayer, uh, Venite or Ven the Venite, which was actually written by a Berkeley Divinity School student, um, and Day by Day. These are three apps that can actually help you pray the daily office every day. And you just open up the app and they'll tell you all the prayers and you can just read through them. So that's another way that you can sort of download this and do this if you haven't been doing it before. <clears throat> um, if you're not used to sort of the daily office, sometimes it can be hard to get into this. And there's a wonderful resource uh, I have, you know, here. It's called Hour by Hour. And you can see this, um, you know, on the screen. It's actually sort of a great introduction to the daily office or daily prayer. And these are some pages from this. Um, you know, uh, every, every day it sort of gives you prayers. Um, they give you, for example, Compline on Sunday evening. And as you can see, it's a simplified form of the daily office, but it's, it's very powerful. There's an opening sentence, you read a Psalm. There's a lesson that you can meditate on. Uh, you have the Lord's Prayer. Um, there's a collect, uh, antiphon, and then it ends with the Song of Simeon, a canticle, another antiphon, and then the grace. Um, it's, it's just the right length, especially if you're starting this sort of prayer practice. Um, and uh, forward movement, uh, I'll show you the sort of in a couple of slides, is where you can get this hour by hour book. Um, and so given there's a week left, uh, you can go there or, or your favorite bookseller or online bookseller, there's still a week left. Um, <clears throat> those of you that are into traditional spiritual practices, there's a wonderful resource called the St. Augustine's Prayer Book. There are actually two of these prayer books. Um, there's a traditional one and a new one. Uh, the traditional one is actually one that uh, I really like a lot. Um, it contains all these things that you can do for Lent. For example, there's a section on the Stations of the Cross. Um, and so it gives you prayers and reflections uh, to, to pray through the Stations of the Cross. Um, so if you're, if you're at church, uh, when the church is open, you can actually reflect upon sort of the traditional stations. Um, there are ways that you can do a self-examination. So on the left side here, it goes through the Ten Commandments and it gives you questions on sort of thinking about, you know, have you done certain things and, you know, and then it also has sections on the rosary. So especially those of you who come from a Roman Catholic background or are more Anglo-Catholic, <clears throat> it gives you ro rosary prayers and instructions. Um, and so, as I mentioned, uh, both Hour by Hour and St. Augustine's Prayer Book, you can get from Forward Movement, um, www.forwardmovement.org. Um, it's a wonderful resource, um, not just these books, but there are all kinds of Lenten resources that I recommend that you check out, as well as church publishing. Um, there are a number of really good uh, Lenten resources um, for Forward Movement and church publishing. Other things that you can do in terms of prayer are you can go on the St. Thomas website and join in terms of services, masses. Um, you know, there, there are plenty of uh, liturgies you can participate in. Um, and then also, if, if you are into Bible study, um, uh, you know, I'm leading theology classes on Sunday mornings at 10. Um, every Sunday, uh, we're studying 2 Corinthians, which is a great Lenten uh, book about suffering. Um, and, and sort of uh, discipleship. And this is also a YouTube channel with um, sort of the previous classes that you can watch um, on 2 Corinthians as well as the Nicene Creed and 1 Corinthians. So there are a lot of resources online. And then finally, I close with the notion of fasting. Um, and, you know, <clears throat> fasting on the one hand can uh, refer to sort of uh, skipping a meal or just instead of three meals, you know, having a main meal and then two smaller meals. Um, but there's also abstinence, uh, which is sort of giving up, let's say meat uh, in favor of seafood, uh, fish. Um, and, you know, doesn't mean that you can like have lobster and, you know, scallops every Friday. I mean, I guess you could, but, but <laughs> the real purpose is to sort of fast or to give up something. Um, and those of you that are in traditional notions of fasting, uh, you, you saw the calendar before, right, with Ash Wednesday and uh, Sir Holy Saturday. Um, you know, the two 
days of fasting are traditionally Ash Wednesday and Good Friday, which is the day before Holy Saturday, um, in terms of, you know, sort of eating sort of one or two meals less. Um, but then also Fridays are like little good Fridays, that those are days that you might want to abstain from, let's say, meat in favor of, you know, vegetarianism or, or you know, having fish. Um, <clears throat> also, you know, people like to give up things for Lent, right? So, so it could not, you know, not just meat, but you could give up chocolate or candy or alcohol or Facebook, um, swearing. I mean, you know, there are lots of things that you can give up. Um, people, you know, also say that Lent is not just about giving up something, but also taking on something. And that's why we talked about sort of prayer and almsgiving, you know, as ways of taking up practices. Um, <clears throat> there's actually a lovely thing that you can find, find on the internet about sort of not just fasting in terms of tangible things, but this is from Pope Francis um, saying that, you know, you should fast, if you want to fast, you can also fast from hurting words and say kind words instead. You can fast from sadness and actually be filled with gratitude, fast from anger and be filled with patience, fast from pessimism and be filled with hope. Um, you can sort of go through these different things, you know, fast from words and be silent so that you can listen. So fasting doesn't have to be food or, or you know, practices, but it can also be a fasting of your interior mindset. Um, and then the National Episcopal Church website, uh, www.episcopalchurch.org, Lenten Resources 2021, will also give you a lot of lovely ways that, you know, you can sort of take on different practices during Lent. And so I commend this to you as well. Um, so we're at the 45 minute mark, I think. Um, you know, we've talked about these three categories of Lenten practices to give, to pray, and to fast which actually reflects the reading from Matthew that is in the Ash Wednesday liturgy. Um, and so hopefully this is a good introduction to you for not only Lent 2021, but the history and the practices of Lent. And if you have any questions, feel free to email me. Uh, happy to chat at any time.